So we'll pick up Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 11 uh, today. As far as the reading, and then uh, we'll pick up in verse 15 for what we're actually going to talk about. And we're going to spend some time in the Old Testament. And we're going to talk about the devil. So that should be fun. All right, so Hebrews 9 beginning in verse 11. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is not of this creation, he entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer sanctified for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Therefore, he is the mediator of a new covenant, so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance, since a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. For where a will is involved, the death of the one who made it must be established. For a will takes effect only at death, since it is not in force as long as the one who made it is alive. Therefore, not even the first covenant was inaugurated without blood. For when every commandment of the law had been declared by Moses to all the people, he took the blood of calves and goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people, saying, this is the blood of the covenant that God commanded for you. And in the same way, he sprinkled with the blood both the tents and all the vessels used in worship. Indeed, under the law, almost everything is purified with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Thus, it was necessary for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these rites, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ has entered not into holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true things, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. Nor was it to offer himself repeatedly as the high priest enters the holy places every year with blood not his own. For then he would have to suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the world. But as it is, he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And just as it is appointed for man to die once and after that comes judgment, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly awaiting for him. Okay. So just call your attention to verse 23. Thus it was necessary for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these rites, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. Let that reverberate throughout your brain tonight. Okay, so as we talked about last week, uh, the Old Covenant wasn't dismissed or discarded. It was replaced. We still need a high priest. We still need a house and a place and an atoning sacrifice. Uh, but it's better because it's the New Covenant in Christ. Both those covenants had rules and procedures. And uh, in the Old Covenant, no one could see all the steps. Only the high priest saw all the steps. So it was only revealed partially to others. Uh, the, high, uh, the priests saw a lot of it, but not everything that the high priest saw. And then the people only saw a part of it. Uh, not everything that the priests were privy to. Okay, so we'll pick it up. We talked last week about uh, the atonement, the atoning sacrifice of Christ. So, as the writer of the Hebrews said, you know, the atoning, Jesus' atoning work was greater than any of these animal sacrifices because Jesus is infinitely better than any animal. Animal sacrifices atone for the sins of the Jews in their flesh, but Jesus' sacrifice atoned for sins in both flesh and spirit which required, one, a life lived perfectly, and two, required him to be God. So Jesus lived a human life perfectly without sin, 
and his defeat of the devil's temptation proved his resolve to be obedient to the Father's will, and then his death was undeserved. Uh, therefore, his death was acceptable payment for our sins, and the Father is willing to apply Christ's payment to our account in the account of anyone who believes that Jesus pays it for you. So then Jesus' blood can at last cleanse our conscience of the guilt of sin, and we feel the weight of the curse of the law being lifted. So it was one thing for the people in the Old Covenant. They had their sins um, cleansed so that they were able to remain living under the law because the sacrifice paid for the penalty of that, but their conscience is still burdened. Right? Their conscience is still burdened until Christ comes uh, because the sacrifices did nothing about the problem of sin. Christ's sacrifice took care of that permanently. Okay, so once your sins are forgiven, you're free, uh, you feel the weight of the law being lifted, you are still are supposed to obey the law because that's what a pleasing life looks like, but because you still can't keep it. But you're free of the guilt of not being able to do it. Okay, and then verse 15 starts off with this wonderful word, now, therefore, that's wrong verse, not therefore. Yeah, therefore. ESV has therefore. Uh, what does NIV have for this reason? Okay. And then, of course, Luther says it best, and that is why. That's what the Luther Bible has, and this is why. This is why these things happened. Okay? Because our consciousnesses could not be cleansed Something better was required, and Christ became that mediator for the new covenant. Um, it's required, and it's better because of the blood, because of the death that inaugurates that new testament. Okay, so the word redemption means to pay a ransom. When you are redeemed, someone has paid a price for you to be redeemed. And then transgression is the same as sin. So transgression, sin, redemption, payment. Um, the Old Covenant never required human sacrifice. Right? Not like some, that always gets everybody all of a sudden looks up, what? No. Right. The Old Covenant didn't require human sacrifice. It required animal sacrifices, which God accepted as substitutes for payments for disobeying the law. The New Covenant, however, requires a human death, a human sacrifice. So we either enter this new covenant with Christ or we don't. Either we die because still the bill comes due. Either the redemption price was paid for you by you believing that Jesus' sacrifice did it or you still owe that payment. You don't believe, whether you believe it or not, the bill comes due. You have to, there is still a human sacrifice required. Your eternal soul is going to burn. That's the payment for our wicked lives here. Okay, so regardless of what you do in the new covenant, uh, human sacrifice is required. We might not think of just dying being a sacrifice, but that's what it is. Okay, so either we pay the penalty or Christ did. Okay, so what makes this new covenant better? Because it begins with a death. All covenants have to have a death. Blood has to be shed. That's what a covenant is. Okay, so it's better because it provides a sacrifice to pay for all the sins committed under the old covenant, wiping out all the sin debt. So it wipes out the sin debt of Israel under the old covenant, which was a debt to God which required repayment. And the payment is, again, a life. Since you didn't need human sacrifices under the old covenant, the old covenant couldn't pay off the debt. Okay, that debt was still owed. You know, it paid off the penalty of the paid off the penalty of the sin, but it didn't pay off the sin. It didn't redeem you from that. It just meant I, I wrote this down better so that I could explain it. Ugh, where do I write it? Because it sounds like I'm saying the same thing twice, and I know that. But, 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 but. Really? Somewhere I wrote this down where it was really, really clear. Uh. All right, well, I'm 
I'm just going to keep going and maybe we'll get there. All right, so regardless, the payment for sin is a human life. So the old covenant couldn't pay off the debt because human, debt, human life was not required. Jesus became the mediator of the new covenant so that he could assume and pay off the debt because Christ's perfect life fulfilled the law. Animal can't fulfill the law. So there was a, a book that was lost for hundreds and hundreds of years, and it's called The Teachings of the Twelve Apostles. Did the Twelve Apostles write it? Eh, probably not. Uh, but it's called The Didache, or The Teaching of the Twelve Apostles. You can read it online. And it could be in the Bible. There's nothing that would in it that would keep it from being in the Bible other than you can't prove who wrote it. In the very beginning, it says, and it's, this is a very apostolic thing. This is the way the church fathers used to talk. And it, would always, it always talks about things in opposites, black, white, like John does, right? Black, white, light, dark, all right? And it says there are two ways. There is one way of life and the other way of death. So those are the two ways under the new covenant. The one of life, which is faith in Christ, that his sacrifice took care of it, or one of death, you've got to pay for it. And that's been taught, was taught from the very beginning, and it got lost for hundreds of years, and then they found this manuscript of it, and they were like, what's this? And now they found others. I think it was like in the 1840s it got discovered. It was lost, you know, for almost 1,500 years. Okay, so now we got to go to Monday, Thursday, okay, the upper room. This is the new covenant in my blood. Okay, so this is Christ's last will and testament. Right? Upon his death, we, through faith, become his beneficiaries of his will. Right? Because where there's a covenant, something has to die. Right? That's how it worked in the old covenant. That's how it works here too. So before the covenant can begin and God delivers on his promises, something had to die. In the Old Covenant, God commanded Moses to sacrifice animals to activate it. You can look at, we've looked at it already before, look at uh, Exodus 24. Moses and the elders meet with the Lord at the altar. They performed a sacrifice, collected the blood, sprinkled it on the Book of the Covenant, as the preacher to the Hebrews just told us, and sprinkled it on the people. And the blood signifies that an agreement is now active. The shedding of blood activates the uh, covenant. Covenant literally means to cut. So if you were making a covenant with somebody, you'd take your animal, you'd hang them up, you'd slice it in half, and you'd walk through the blood. You'd walk through the two halves, both parties. And so in that shedding of blood, now it's a blood bond. It's, it's uh, official. Something had to die for it to be official. Okay, so that blood signifies that something's in action that would only be broken by another death. Okay, so once the tabernacle had been built, the practice of sacrificing was altered by God a little bit. Blood was sprinkled by the high priest and all the appointments in the tent, all the furniture had to get baptized, baptizo, to wash, washed with the blood. Uh, and that cleansed those things to be used in the tabernacle in liturgical use. Now, since we're all sinners, and they were all sinners, there was need of continual sacrifice because you're still a sinner. Even though your sins have been forgiven, you're still a sinner. And they're like, well, that still happens today. We'll get to that with the new covenant. So there still had to be continual bloodshed because you had to keep paying for the sins. So you had to keep anointing the tabernacle, the people, the priests, blood had to keep being shed because it wasn't a one and done. It was continuous. You sin and you're going to still be in there being a priest in the tabernacle. Well, you're going to make these things in the tabernacle impure. You got to anoint them with blood too. You have to keep doing this stuff. So you had to keep, you were required under the old covenant to keep applying blood to cleanse sin and because sin always requires a death. But this blood in the Old Covenant is a type, a typology, we say, or a type of something that's much greater. And of course, that is going to be Christ's blood shed on the cross. You look like you have a question. No question? Question? No question? Question? Okay. Okay, 
So Christ's blood, of course, is a much greater, more powerful sacrifice, does things a little different. So now the preacher is going to set out to explain how it's different, how in the new covenant in Christ improves upon the old covenant, and it's all for our sake. And it begins by saying what happens in the tabernacle. So we're staying here on earth in the temporal realm. Uh, But he's also saying not only did it happen here on earth, it also happened in heaven. What? Okay. So remember that verse I said to keep letting it reverberate, right? Verse 23. Verse 23. Thus it was necessary for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these rites, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. So that's saying the stuff in heaven had to be purified too. Weird. We'll get to that. Okay, so what happened here on earth also had to happen there. The heavenly tabernacle also had to be cleansed from sin. From sin, yeah. Why would the heavenly tabernacle require such cleansing? Paul explains it, so we have to use the Bible to do some detective work here. So Paul explains that there is wickedness beyond just what is here on earth. Let's look at Ephesians 6, 12. Ephesians 6.12 says, hmm? Ephesians 6.12. I think, yeah, 12. And this is that section put on the whole armor of God, right? For we do not wrestle, everybody knows this, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, or against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Huh. Read that again. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. All right. Now what Paul's cautioning us there is you have to put on the armor of God because you're fighting something that's not mortal, that's not human. Right? You want to go out and fight a human. You put on body armor, you strap yourself up with some like grenades and guns and stuff, and you go to war. But that isn't going to work against demons, because he's a demon. So you're going to need spiritual armament, the whole armor of God. But then we're going to be like, okay, so though it's behind, what's behind the scenes, what's behind the veil a little bit, is all the problems in the world. Well, yeah, the devil's got his fingers in it. So, yeah, that's who you're really fighting. Uh, so don't don't go to an exorcism with an with an AK forty seven. It's not going to turn out well for you. You go to an exorcism with the Word of God. That's the weapon. That's neither here nor there. But Paul is talking about Lucifer. Okay, he's talking about the devil, Satan, the accuser, Satana, the accuser, as in the prosecuting attorney in a court of law. Okay. And he can move between, or he could at one time move between heaven and earth freely. Let's look at Job chapter 1. Great book. If you haven't read Job, time to read Job again. Job chapter 1, verse 1. And not Obadiah, Job, dummy. Okay, so... Yeah, I'm not even going to go there. Uh, one of these days we should do a Bible study on Job, but that's a really long book, and i got to figure out how to do it where we don't have to look at every single word he says, and we'll be here for three years. I told you that story. I know a pastor that did a Bible study in the book of Romans. took three years. Three years. That's what I think of when I think, wow, this is taking too long. Yeah, three years, which I can see that with Romans. Okay, so Job chapter 1, beginning in verse 6. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. In this instance, the sons of God is talking about angels. There was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. The Lord said to Satan, from where have you come? Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro on the earth and from walking up and down on it. And the Lord said to Satan, 
Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil? And Satan answered the Lord and says to Job, fear God for no reason. Have you not put a hedge around him and his house and all that he has on every side? You've blessed the work of his hands and his possessions have increased in the land, but stretch out your hand and touch all that he has and he will curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, behold, all that he has is in your hand, only against him do not stretch out your hand. And so Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. So God said, yeah, do your worst. He's going to be fine. And spoiler alert, yeah, Job eventually winds up fine, but it's, it's a hard story to read. Biggest takeaway from Job, which I tell everybody this is, if, if you feel you need to pray for patience, go read Job first and then think if you really want to do that. Because the way God teaches patience is he gives you trial. That's how he makes you patient, is you are going to suffer. You may want to think that over. Do you really want to pray for patience? Is that what you should be praying for? Are you asking the right question? Okay. Hmm? Strength is, Strength is probably a better word. Because patience means you're doing it on your own. I mean, it is one of the fruits of the Spirit, but is it really what you're asking for when you ask for that? Maybe not. All right, so we see Satan could walk right up to God in the throne room and say, okay, hey, you know, I've been on earth. Nice. Oh, well, did you check out this guy? Yeah. But you've protected him. So of course he loves you. But let's do this and find out what if. God says, fine. That's what we're dealing against. AK-47, not going to work. Now let's look at Ezekiel 28, because that's also going to tell us about this desecration that happened in heaven. How it did sin enter a heavenly place? So is Ezekiel 28, beginning in verse 12. Before we get started and before everybody looks at me cross-eyed because you're going, what do you think this is about? Okay, this is one of those wonderful passages from the Old Testament that's about more than one thing. Hebrew is weird, and the Hebrew in Ezekiel is extremely weird, and I'm not even going to pretend to understand it, but all the Hebrew scholars agree, yeah, this is about more than one thing at a time. First off, they are talking about the uh, Prince of Tyre, all right? That's Ithobal II, in case you care about which king we're talking about. Uh, I've never heard of Ithobal II from history. Yeah, he wasn't that big a deal. So he, he was a bad guy. And Ezekiel is going to compare him to Satan. And so he's going to do this in kind of an allegory where he's actually condemning uh, the word of the Lord comes to Ezekiel and says, tell this guy these things, boop, 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 boop. And he's basically going to lay out the history of Satan and say, that's you. But he's doing it with an allegory. He's going to say, okay, th this is what happened to Lucifer. And I'm calling you Lucifer because you're as bad as him, basically. So he's like, but this is about a king. What does this got to do with the devil? You'll, you'll see. And you'll hear it and you'll see it. So if we jump down to verse 12 to where it gets good. Um... Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, son of man, raise a lamentation over the king of Tyre and say to him, thus says the Lord God, you were the signet of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering, sardius, topaz, and diamond, beryl, onyx, and jasper, sapphire, emerald, and carbuncle, and crafted in gold were your settings and your engravings. On the day that you were created, they were prepared. You were anointed guardian cherub. I placed you, you were on the holy mountain of God, in the midst of the stones of fire you walked, you were blameless in your ways from the day you were created, till unrighteousness was found in you. In the abundance of your trade, you were filled with violence in your midst, and you sinned. So I cast you as a profane thing from the mountain of God, and I destroyed you, O guardian cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Your heart was proud because of your beauty. You're corrupt, you're, you corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your spen, splendor. I cast you to the ground. I exposed you before kings to feast their eyes on you. By the multitude of your iniquities and the unrighteousness of your trade, you profaned your sh sanctuaries, 
So I brought fire out from your midst to consume you, and I turned you to ashes on the earth in the sight of all who saw you. And all who know you among the peoples are appalled at you. You have come to a dreadful end and shall be no more forever. Who's that sound like? I mean, yeah, this, this is a pretty brutal thing to tell a king that this is what's going to happen to you. But that's all about Satan's fall also. He's telling you the story of the day the fall uh, from the heavenly paradise happened. So, and, and tradition does hold and comes from texts like this and other extra biblical texts that the Jews have. Uh, Satan was widely regarded as the most beautiful of angels. Um, he was like the favorite. All right? He had a high position. Um, spectacularly adorned. It talks about all these gemstones and whatnot and that they were created for him. Right. So how did Satan serve God? Okay, he's in a garden, but this is an Eden because the holy mountain of God is Zion. Okay, Zion is the name for the heavenly Jerusalem. And we can find that in Hebrews 12 when we get to it. Also in Revelation 21, you see the descent of the heavenly Jerusalem when God chooses now to dwell with us here on the new earth. Okay, and after his fall, he was cast to the earth. So therefore, there is a heavenly Eden upon which the earthly Garden of Eden was based. Because as with most things, there is a heavenly version and the earthly version that's just a pale comparison of it, just like the tabernacle. And the temple was a pale facsimile of the throne room in heaven. Okay? So Satan served God in this heavenly Eden, this heavenly Zion. He was the guardian cherubim. Okay, so what do we know about cherubim? Okay, there were the two things sculpted on top of the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant, right? So they were the guardians of the mercy seat on earth. So that must mean that there are guardian cherubim above the throne in heaven, which there are. You can read about it in Revelation. So you have the image there of, of the, the creatures around the throne. Okay, so that was kind of Satan's job, right? He covered the glory of God in the heavenly places. Okay, and then Ezekiel says Satan profaned his sanctuaries, the heavenly places. He profaned it in the tent, the holy place, the most holy place in heaven, right there at the throne of God. So Satan somehow defiled those places in heaven. So how did it come that Satan fell and was able to desecrate those heavenly faces? Well, Satan succumbed to pride. Now we're going to be skating the line of doctrine and tradition a little bit, or what the text actually says and what tradition actually says. Because we don't know that much about the devil, but we do have, there's pieces all over of this stuff. Okay, so how did Satan come to fall and desecrate the heavenly places? So... He was the angel closest to the glory of God, which was a huge high honor, right? So he began to think that he was equal to God because he's right there. And you start thinking, when somebody heaps glory on you, you start to think pretty well of yourself, right? Even though that person that heaped the glory on you could take it all away, you start thinking, well, I deserve this. Look how great I am. It's just like humans do. So he started to think that he was equal to God because of his position. We love God. He is the one that creates and blesses us. But we have a tendency to stop thinking about him and start loving ourselves above him, right? That's what we do. Okay, so Lucifer became corrupted by his own image of his perfection, which obviously he wasn't then completely perfect but he was thinking that he was inherently important, that he was important, self-important, right? It's vanity, it's pride. That polluted his heart, thinking that he was equal to God. And that was his downfall. So his fall, his doing that in the heavenly places defiled those heavenly places by that sin 
I don't know if you call it sin when an angel does it, but I assume so. When that sin occurred in the heavenly places, that defiled them. Okay, look at Philippians 2.6. Why am I so brain dead today? So Philippians 2, 6 says, go back to 5. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. Okay, so that's talking about Christ. So as the Son of God, Jesus is God. He doesn't just look like God. He is equal to God. He can't be less than fully God. But he didn't hold on to that privilege. Is that a word we should use anymore today? The way it gets thrown around. So he didn't think that that privilege of being God it was something to be grasped while he was here. He didn't use his divine nature all the time. He used it like fractionally. Right. Most of the time, he was just a guy living a perfect life on earth. He didn't cheat. He didn't use his divine nature to make sure he didn't sin. His human nature didn't sin. But then his whole nature, God and man died on the cross. Both God and man died, so God died. Right? He didn't think himself, he didn't think that was something to be grasped in his condition, to be the savior of the world. He did not elevate himself to be on the same with God. That was Satan's mistake. He thought he was on, he should be, and I'm putting words in his mouth, I'm reading into the text. He thought he should be equally as good and powerful as God. Right? And that is his fall. That's what undid him. All right, so the preacher in Hebrews is telling us, that the heavenly places had to be cleansed as well because of all this. You know, it's not because you know Jesus became a man, so they have to cleanse heaven before he goes back or anything like that. It's because of what Satan did, defiling those heavenly places. So, chapter 9. Thus it was necessary for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these rites, meaning the old covenant here on earth, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. So what was the better sacrifice? Christ's ascension into heaven, sitting down at the right hand of God. And by his blood in the heavenly places, cleansed the heavenly places of the unrighteousness that happened there. Stretch? Little? Maybe? I don't know. I don't think anything I said is not true. Uh, but you're not going to get that in your average Sunday school lesson about Hebrews, I don't think. Uh, that's just from putting a lot of pieces together because I study angels and demons. So, like, the history of Satan is very fascinating to me. Uh, where all of our traditions and, and iconography and everything else come from. And the biblical evidence I shared with you kind of paints that picture. And the text does specifically say, you know, that those heavenly places also had to be cleansed. Um, just as an aside, uh, the whole when Jesus said, I saw, I saw Satan fall like lightning, has nothing to do with the fall of Lucifer. That has everything to do with, uh, that was actually a figure of speech talking about the demons being cast out when his disciples were going out and healing people and casting out demons. He used that metaphor. I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. That wasn't actually talking about the fall the, that day. For some reason, a lot of people want to think it is, but because they don't teach it well. All right, so the heavenly sanctuary had to be per, had to be cleansed, and it had to be cleansed by a greater sacrifice than just these animals. So a human sacrifice was required to pay the problem of sin to put an end to sin for us, Christ had to live that perfect life and die. God had to die because God cleansed those heavenly places from the stain that the fall of Satan and him taking like a third of the angels with him caused. Uh, again, if you don't agree with me, your salvation is not injustice. This is just interesting. Uh, 
I think it's very well reasoned from the commentaries I read. You may read stuff that goes, where did you, what, this is too weird. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. But trying to explain that verse in Hebrews, verse 23. And like, I love it, like the Lutheran study Bible, when they don't know how to touch something, they just skate around it and they'll just say, the tabernacle seen by Moses was the original. The tabernacle made by the Israelites was a copy. The heavenly things, Moses saw these. Christ opens the heavenly realms to us. has nothing to say about that they had to be purified with better sacrifices than these. They just skip that. Like, oh, I want help on that verse. No help. They, they're not touching it, uh, which they do with some of the tougher stuff. And that's the rabbit hole I went down, <laughs> finding out what that verse means. So there you go. Uh, but it makes sense. You know, it makes sense. You have this accuser, and then at some point, the accuser can't stand and accuse you anymore. He's no longer allowed to stand there. He's not allowed, like today, he can't go up there. Like when, when you die, you're not going to be standing up there in front of the gates, and Satan's going to be there going, hi, I'm your prosecuting attorney. He can't do that anymore. He is not allowed there. He's stuck here. As you read in that Ezekiel passage, it said he was cast down to earth. You know, when he was made ash and fire and all that. It's like, okay, you're cast out of heaven. You can't go back. You can still do. I'm going to permit you to mess around down here with people because it'll work ultimately to my glory. They will see the need for me to turn to me and repent. So you go right on ahead doing what you're doing down here. But you can't come up here and accuse them anymore because Christ died. He paid the price. All I see is Jesus when I look at these people because I declare them not guilty and you got nothing to say about it anymore. That's the big takeaway with where Satan. If you notice, and if you read Job, all of a sudden, you know, the devil's there. Poke, 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 poke. Yeah, I bet if you do this, he'll curse your name. Then all of a sudden, the devil just disappears. He's just gone. Like the whole, like the two-thirds of the story in Job is left. You don't see Satan anymore. It's not like, oh, gee, God, you told me so. It's, no, no, he just like, yeah. I blew that one, he's gone. You don't even see him again. It's bizarre. It's a bizarre story. So that's what they're talking about in Hebrews. So we're talking about the the necessity for this. A life was required. Christ's life cleansed everything. It not only cleansed the earthly places, it cleansed the heavenly places. It took care of everything, and it had to do it once. And we'll see that in chapter 10. Wow, I went way too fast tonight. But when we, when we get into chapter 10, we'll see that because it's going to be all about Christ's once for all sacrifice. Again, he didn't have to go, okay, you know, here's the day of atonement. We have to sacrifice Christ again. Or like the Roman Catholic Church does every Sunday, we have to re-sacrifice Christ again because it's something we do for God. We're going to offer God as a sacrifice back to God. How do they not see that that's ridiculous? I don't know, but they do. And if they tell you different, they don't know their own doctrine. And i got to get my little whack in at the Roman Catholics. Once in a while, it's Lutheran, it's what we do. Okay, any questions? That was the end of Chapter 9. We're not starting Chapter 10. We're going to look at, in more detail, uh, some of this comparison between the Old Testament and New Testament divine service. Questions? Comments? I'm, I'm nuts, and you don't buy anything I just said in the last 20 minutes. It's okay. If you, there are other. Actually, there are others that take it even further, and I think they go too far. Um, and they start pulling in things that there's really no scriptural evidence for. Um, I really do think everything I said is grounded in scripture. But again, if it burdens your conscience, put it out of your head. Forget it. It does not. Nothing we talked about where that's concerned, where the devil was concerned, and his getting kicked out of heaven. None of that matters to your salvation, other than he can't accuse you anymore, all right? Because uh, we're allowed to disagree over that kind of stuff. It's not, it's not even doctrinal. It's, it's historical. It's a lot of tradi- church tradition wrapped up in there for a couple thousand years. Um, and I think it's interesting. So I sure shared my opinion. Other than I wanted to answer the question, Why did the heavenly places have to be cleansed? That's the only good thing I can find scripturally of what happened in heaven that would require cleansing. And that's the only thing that I can find. But maybe you want to 
disagree with that, that is also okay. Okay? Let's talk about the role of the high priest on the Day of Atonement and how Jesus is better. Unless you have questions, no questions? Okay. All right, this is mostly going to be in chapter 9 and in part of what we're talking about here. Do we have to read the Day of Atonement again in Exodus? We're all pretty familiar. So Day of Atonement, you know, first you've got to do your regular sacrifices. The priest has to do his sacrifices. And they used to go in. Every day they offered sin offerings, but on the Day of Atonement, they had a special one where they put all the sins of Israel on this goat, and the goat gets sent out into the desert to die with all the sins of Israel on it. Because, again, something's got to die. You want sins forgiven, something's got to die. The goat had to die. All right, so let's talk about what actually happens on the Day of Atonement. So, and that's all on your sheet where it says the role of the high priest on the Day of Atonement. So, on the Day of Atonement, in the Old Covenant, first thing you got to do is go into the most holy place. And that is what your map on the other side is there for. shows you the structure of the temple. So, the other thing that's kind of cool, by the way, so you've got the, the map of the temple, right? Actually, the tabernacle, the temple's modeled after it. So it's two squares side by side. So if you just look at that one half of it, the cool half that's got the Holy of Holies and the holy place on it, it's a square. And if you read the description of Revelation and what the New Jerusalem looks like, it's the city comes down out of the sky and it's a square. It's the same proportions. Kind of neat. Anyhow. So the priest is going to enter into the most holy place. So entry into the second tent, that inner shrine that you see on the picture. You've got another, you know, you've got the main tent, and then inside the tent, you have the outer court and the inner court. Before you go to the inner court, that's a whole another tent. Once a year, he could go into the inner, into this holy of holies. You could go into the holy places try this again. He could only enter in there by himself once a year. That was on the Day of Atonement. And again, we've mentioned he had to tie a rope around his waist because if you screwed something up, if you screw something up when you're doing your thing in the most holy place, God will kill you. And nobody else can go in to get your body out because they're not allowed to go in there unless they're the high priest. So they could pull him by the rope and get his body out of there. Uh, Otherwise, that would be bad. Okay. So entry into the second tent, the inner shrine, by himself once a year. Then Christ, as our high priest in heaven, well, he entered into the heavenly place, the most heavenly place, the right hand of the Father, also once, but once forever. Okay? So it's not like a high priest who is moving into a copy of, you know, a three-dimensional facsimile of the most holy place in heaven, which represents the most holy place in heaven. He actually is going into the most holy place, the presence of God, the right hand of the Father. And he he does that once, and he never has to enter it again. He does once by way of his all-atoning sacrifice. Right, So he enters into heaven, the real thing, not a copy. He's not acting on behalf of anybody. He's the real deal. He is the high priest. He is the sacrifice, which brings us to the next line. So you have to have, you have, to have sacrificial victims. You have to have things that die. Goats and bulls every year, every day, actually. Goats and bulls have to die for the sins of the people and of the priests. Jesus is the one-time atoning sacrifice for all. Why was it good enough for all time? Because he's God. Because he's a perfect man. He's also God. And so perfect man, perfect God died and came back to life. And you never have to die again because you only died once. But that paid for everything, which is going to be what the next line is about. I keep getting ahead of myself. So the purpose of the sacrifice, right? The high priest offered sacrifice on account of his own sins. 
because he has to be cleansed before he can stand in behalf of the people and cleanse his sins. And I think we talked about this before. That's why I commune myself before I commune anybody else. And it's like, why does he do that? Well, number one, because they teach you to do it that way. And the reason they teach you to do it that way is because it actually teaches something. The thing it teaches is, I am receiving the benefits of the Lord's Supper, the forgiveness of sins before I give it to you guys. Would you want me to have my sins forgiven before I start handing this stuff to you? So they are representing the same thing you saw the priest do. They had to offer the, the sin offering for themselves before they offered the offering for the sin of the people. So I am taking that benefit of forgiveness of sins for myself. And then if you read like in the little rubric in your hymnal, it said the pastor then communes those who assist him and then they commune everybody because whoever's going to assist me, if I have that for the distribution, I commune them next. I don't do them last. I do them next because they're going to be handling these sacred things to give it to you. So you want their sins to be forgiven too. That's what that represents. So it is teaching something. Because some people are like, well, why is the pastor got to go first? Is he better than everybody else? No, he's worse than everybody else. That's why he goes first. That's the actual reason. Okay, so he had to offer these sacrifices on behalf of his own sins. And then he has to offer the sacrifice on account of the people's sins of ignorance. Ooh, what's the sin of ignorance? That's the sins you do that you didn't know you did. Right? Which is also why... We don't have to enumerate all of our sins when we go to confession because we'd never leave because you can't remember them all. So you have, what is that, 9 7? Spells it out or was it in chapter 7? But into the second only the high priest goes and he but once a year and not without taking blood, which he offers for himself and the unintentional sins of the people. So, again, yes, the Day of Atonement, all the sins of the people are paid for, but especially on the Day of Atonement, that's all the sins you don't, your sins of ignorance, your sins you don't remember you did. And that especially because they were offering sin offerings every day. Uh, and like I said, we can, I can point you to resources to go down that rabbit hole for the evidence of these sin offerings were offered every day. Uh, it gets deep and it gets heavy. There is a lot of Jewish history with all that stuff, and we'd be here forever <laughs> if we went over a lot of it. I got just like, okay, I take your word for it. There's evidence. There's evidence. Okay? But especially on the Day of Atonement, the sins you don't know you did, the sins of ignorance. Okay? Now, the purpose of Christ's sacrifice for us is to obtain eternal redemption. Uh, the annulment of sin, that's a great word. It's like they never happened. All these great legal words that have to do with sin, right? Annulment, like it never happened. And to bear the sins of many people, people get uptight about that word, many. You know, like this is, you know, this is the new covenant of my blood shed for many, St. Mark says, for the words of institution. Well, who are the many? Does that mean some are excluded? Yes. And God knows who those are. It doesn't mean you can't come to faith. It's like, oh, you've been destined for hell since the beginning. No, you weren't. God wants all people to be saved. God wants all people to recognize his body and blood and, and partake of that gift. Jesus says many because he knows it doesn't mean everyone. Not everyone is going to listen. Not everyone is going to see. All right? So to obtain eternal redemption, to obtain annulment of all sins, the ones you knew you did, the ones you didn't know you did, the things you did you shouldn't have done, the things you didn't do you should have done, all of them. All right, so what's the offering? Blood. It's a blood offering. Okay, the high priest sacrifices blood. Something had to die for him. Something has to die for the other priests, and something had to die for the people, but it's not his blood. There's a substitute. Okay, Jesus, the great high priest in heaven, offers his own blood. He offers himself, his body, the flesh. Let's look at 10. 10 is going to be a great a great chapter which we will study next week some but we'll just bounce off a couple things here. Uh, who is he quoting? That is uh, yeah this is Psalm 40. 
and we'll look at Psalm 40 a little bit more maybe next week. So consequently, when Christ came into the world, he said, sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body have you prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sin offerings you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, behold, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written of me in the scroll of the book. So Christ, quoting the words of the, actually the preacher of the Hebrews, quoting Christ, quoting Psalm 40, David speaking about the sacrifice of the Christ. Uh, Every priest stands daily to service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifice. Verse 12. 10 verse 12, but when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet, for by a single offering he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. Okay? So that's the preacher explaining what Christ's atoning sacrifice did. So that word sanctified again means to make holy, to make holy. So your sins are annulled like they never happened. Well, if it's like you've never sinned, then you are holy because God created you in his image. And God created you in his image to do be two things. And what is that? I already told you one, holy. God created you to be holy. So creating God's image means you are holy. And the other thing is God is what? Sunday school answer. God is, four-letter word, love. So God is love. So the image of God is to be created holy and created to love someone other than yourself. So then, with Christ's sacrifice and the death of our flesh, finally, you know, our corrupted flesh so that we can put on our new eternal flesh at the resurrection of the dead, uh, then, then we will be holy and perfect and able to be just like we were created to be, that we have no idea what that's like because we have no frame of reference. We can talk about it all we want. Oh, it's going to be like this, and it's going to be like that. And then, yeah, our words don't even come close because we have no frame of reference of what being holy is or what love is. We have no idea. We have no frame of reference because we were born into a broken world. Adam and Eve knew what it was. They could explain to people for a few hundred years while they were still alive what it was. And those people they explained it to, their grandkids and great-grandkids, were just going, I have no idea what you're talking about because already they had no frame of reference. They didn't understand what that means. They couldn't even understand what they had lost when they explained it to them. It's like, this is what it was like. And they should be like, I don't know what that is because the frame of reference was already broken. Like, Imagine how frustrating that could be. You know, when you think about it, Adam and Eve lived for... I don't, well, we don't know when the fall happened, but we know Adam lived to be 900 and something. Not as old as Methuselah, but he got up there. So that was many generations of children born that could still go talk to, you know, Grandpa Adam and Grandma Eve. And what were those conversations like? Okay? They were there when it happened. They were the only ones that knew what it was like to be in the image of God and then to lose the image of God. There's like, maybe they're just like, oh, you know what, we're just going to go away because it's too depressing. I don't know. There's actually a fiction writer that, that wrote a series of books, and he based it on great biblical characters. There's no, they're not Christian. They're, not, they're, they're fantasy novels. But because these people were so long-lived, he digs up all this mythology and just kind of twists it and makes a book about it. And they're fun. One of them is about Adam. And it's like Adam and Eve are hiding in this cave. They don't really talk to people much because... They, uh, uh, what I got out of it was because there was no frame of reference. You couldn't comprehend what these people are talking about. We don't know what that's like. Stop talking about what it was like in the garden. We don't get it. Okay, so they just went and lived in the cave because it was less troublesome. I don't know. Until, you know, a mighty quest was afoot and then they went and talked to them. I don't recommend them. They're okay. But it's just like, yeah, there's a lot of like stuff I know from the Bible in here and there's too much fiction and they're, ugh. Anyway, that's neither here nor there. The idea of this image of God that we lost, okay? We're going to get that back. Don't even bother. <laughs> don't even bother, because you can't. No frame of reference. It's just like, well, you don't know what it's like to, you know, to be a parent until you have a child. No, you don't. You don't. And, and you don't know what it's like to own a dog until you own a dog. No, you don't. It says, 
on the Day of Atonement, the people eagerly waited for the high priest to come back out of the Holy of Holies. When he appeared, they knew that the sacrifice on their behalf had been accepted by God. Mm -hmm. In the same way, when Christ appears at his second coming, it will be confirmation that the Father has been fully satisfied with the Son's sacrifice on behalf of the believers. At that point, salvation will be consummated. Yes, and that is true. And we will get into those words a little bit further into the book. We're, we're getting, we're getting, and we're on the home stretch. But yeah, because you're going to think, well, the consummation hasn't taken place yet. Yes, your sins are forgiven. Christ atoned for all of your sins, but it ain't over till the last day when He comes again in His glory, because there has to be the final judgment, and the final judgment is going to be not guilty, not guilty, not guilty. And unfortunately, for some of the people out there, yeah, you're going to the other place, and it's too late. Uh, and then Christ will return in his glory. And then, yes, that will be the, the consummation, is a good word, of salvation history. It will be, it's finished, but it ain't over. Yeah, we talk about the priest right. coming out, but we don't, but kind of, we kind of stuck right there. There are these things that it is coming out, being pulled out or whatever. Right, and, and, that, is significant and, that's a good, and that's a good way to think of it, because again, when you see something happening here, that God said, okay, you guys got to do this, and it will be a you know, remembrance of, for all your generations. It's got to be a model after something in heaven, probably. And so that's what it is. It's a model of the priest not having to get drug out by the, by the rope is going to be like Christ returning on the last day from, from heaven, not at his second coming. Um, I, imagine if they, I imagine it was really quiet in the camp when they had to pull him out by the rope. And it was like, so what do we do? Like um, new high yeah, and then the new high priest is going. Oh man, really? And it's like what? No, the other guy. Yeah. They also speak of two advents. His first advent was to save us from the penalty of sin. Mm -hmm. His second part, his second from the power of sin. Yeah, the and power of sin, sin, which is death. Right. Yep. Yep, and that's what the word Advent means. It just means coming. You know, Epiphany is a revealing. So, like, what's Epiphany? Is Epiphany was, well, I mean, Christmas was a revealing to the Jews, which they ignored. And then Epiphany, right, when the wise men come, that is his revealing Epiphany to the Gentiles. And then that was his first Advent, was his 30-some, 30 33-some years on earth. His second Advent will be when he comes again at the end. Not just the season of the church here, though it is, but um, I was gonna say. I had something really profound to say, and no, I forgot. Advent coming on the last day. Glory. I don't remember. I guess it wasn't that profound. Uh, so yeah, think about there's usually a parallel between these actions that we're given to do here on earth. There's usually a parallel to something happening in the heavenly realm or the overall universe. Okay, so because Christ being sacrificed and the high priest that offered it, so now what's the result? Well, you have purification of, in the Old Covenant, you have purification of the earthly copies of stuff uh, or the author of the commentary uses the word antitype. I think he's using the word antitype in this context incorrectly. So just call it a type or a typology. He's using antitype as a synonym for that. All a type is is an allegory or a parallel. You know, so like the the temple is a type of the heavenly throne room. It's an, it's a foreshadowing. It's not as glorious as, but it points us to kind of what it's like. Okay. Or, um, let's see, let's try and think. You know, the, the scapegoat, the, you know, the, the atonement, the day of atonement, that, that scapegoat that goes out in the wilderness to die with all the sins heaped on it, that is a type of Christ, a typology of Christ. It's going to be kind of what Christ does, but Christ is going to be even greater and more perfect, more complete. So that's all a type is, and they use that word all the time. Um, the uh, wine and bread that Melchizedek brought out to 
Abram. That's a type of the Lord's Supper. It's, gonna, it's a fellowship meal. It's going to point toward what Jesus is going to do. It's not the same, but it's going to be similar. It's pointing to it uh, because Melchizedek is this priest and also king, which is what Jesus is. All right, so the purification of the earthly copies of this stuff. So the holy place is kept pure. The most holy place is kept pure. The appointments in the tabernacle and later the temple are kept pure. The priests are kept pure. The high priest keeps pure. All of this so they can even be ready to begin to offer these sacrifices, which had to be pure and without blemish. I mean, you couldn't just go up there and slaughter any animal. It had to be the best. Uh, That was what the issue was with Cain and Abel, right? So Abel offered the first fruits of his flock, and he burned the fatty portions because God likes to smell of the good stuff burning on the altar. So he offers the best. Cain just made an offering. I mean, it's not that he didn't do his duty. He offered, but he didn't do it with a glad heart. He didn't offer the best. Did he offer the youngest, tenderest shoots of whatever he grew? No. He just burned something and said, here, this is for God. Abel joyfully gave the best. That's what the problem was. Not because one was a... You know, it's like, well, Abel gave, you know, an animal and Cain just gave, like, fruit or what, grain. Well, Cain was a farmer. That's what he did. He just didn't give. He gave it begrudgingly. Like, oh, I have to do this, so I'm going to do it. But, yeah, right? That's what his problem was. All right? So all these, these offerings have to be pure, without blemish. Of course, Christ is pure, without blemish, sinless. It was purification for the heavenly places purification of the conscience of those here. So yes, your sins were forgiven, but I'm still a sinner. Ugh. Well, you offer another sacrifice tomorrow for those sins. But, and then the next day, and then the next day. For us, it's different because he offered his once for all sacrifice for the sins of the world. Not only, oh, my sins are forgiven, the guilt of sin is gone. Yeah, I'm still a sinner, so What? Now, that just doesn't mean, no, I don't go sinning like crazy because I'm forgiven. It's, yeah, I'm still a sinner, but so what? Christ covered it. Yeah, I'm gonna, I got to work on it. Yeah, I have to repent because I'm still a sinner. I know I'm worthless, and I'm thankful for that gift. And I know what a God-pleasing looks like, life looks like, and I'm not living it. But I'm not afraid of death. I'm not afraid to die because I know where I'm going when I do. And then this struggle with my conscience, this struggle with sin will be over. And that's what we look forward to. So when somebody dies, yay, they're free. Yeah, we'll miss them. But they're free. We're not. That's why we're still here. And And struggle ain't a good word for it. I would rather wouldn't the word awareness of sin? When you say struggle, it makes me think that we have to, we gotta overcome this, and we can't. No, you can't. Okay. But aware that it is always with us, and to sounds crazy, but to live with it to the glory of God in making what we do and say heavenly minded. Mm-hmm. You know, but I, I don't like the wrong. Yes. The struggle is a fight. You know, and we're not and fighting sin is useless. It's, you know, yeah. awareness yeah. of it is, and then you go on with whatever it is that you do to overcome it. But I think it's awareness of the guilt being gone. Because we can say that the Old Testament people, you know, were aware of their sin, and that was the problem. Their conscience wasn't eased by these sacrifices. Like, yeah, I sinned. I offer the sacrifice for the sin and I'm still a sinner and I got to offer another sacrifice for my sin. Am I truly forgiven or not? Yeah, they have faith in the Messiah to come who's going to take all this away. And that faith is what saved them. But under the law, living in that system, you're never satisfied. God's never satisfied. So it's that burden of the conscience that finally frees it, that, that we're freed from. So yeah, struggle sounds like something you can overcome. Yeah, so it's not the best word. So that's not the best word. 
you know, strong, uh, something you well, something you wrestle with. It sounds like something you can eventually win. Well, and that's right? true because some there may be an, a, something in our life that is that is a well, the sin comes in sizes or colors, but <clears throat> we can we're, we're, we're so aware that it's there, and it's gonna and that I've never overcome it, but it's not going to overcome me. Yes. And that's where you know that your conscience has been eased. So, yeah, and that, and I, I love this phrase of Luther, so it's a good time to bring it up and then we'll stop. Uh, that's why Luther said sin boldly. Okay, and they put it on t-shirts, and I wish they wouldn't because it's taken out of context. And it's like, oh, yeah, you know, Luther's saved by grace. Sin boldly because, yeah, you know, Jesus died for that. Well, yeah, he did. That's not what he meant. He meant that don't become paralyzed from trying to do good. Because all of your good works are tainted by sin. There's nothing good you can do for your neighbor that is not tainted by sin somehow, no matter how hard you try, because you're a sinner. But don't let that paralyze you. Well, I might as well not do anything good because even the good things I do are sinful. No, sin boldly and do them. That's what he meant. Uh, but they take that way out of context. But that's, that's what being free from the, your conscience being free from the guilt of sin. Yeah, I'm still a sinner. I know it. And, you know, this life is hard enough knowing that, knowing that I'm a sinner, knowing what I'm doing is wrong, knowing that it doesn't make God very happy, knowing that this is what I should be doing in service to my neighbor and not doing it. But at least my conscience is cleansed knowing that Jesus died for that. But it doesn't make now our everyday life that any more easier. It actually makes it harder because the people that don't know they're sinners, they got it made. If you don't know you're a sinner, then just go live your life. That's wonderful. You're going to have a very rude awakening, but your time here will be great. Right? Yeah. Right? But knowing you're a sinner, ugh, doesn't make it any easier. But then you, well, it is and it isn't. I mean, it is and it isn't. But, okay. but Jesus even tells us. For yeah, I mean, because <laughs> Jesus even tells us, you know, yeah, come and follow me and then everything's going to be good. He goes, no, come and follow me. It's going to get harder. It's like, well, why is it going to get harder? Because people are going to make fun of you because they're going to think you're stupid. Oh, yeah. Yeah, like we need help with that sometimes. But, yeah. I mean, you have that constant reminder. It's like, well, I'm not as wonderful as I think I am. And that's the second use of the law. So let's review that real quick. Right? Three uses of the law. The curb, the mirror, and the guide. The curb's the one written on your heart. We know instinctively right and wrong. It's wired into us. God put that there so society wouldn't devolve into complete chaos. Second use of the law, the mirror. You hold the mirror up to yourself. The law holds up a mirror to you, and all you see is sinner. And if it ain't doing that, you got a problem. Uh, and then the third use is the guide. Okay, what's the guide? The guide It's the handbook. How to live a good life. It looks just like the law. It's the Ten Commandments kept perfectly. Love the Lord with all the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and your neighbor as yourself. You can do that, you're living a God-pleasing life. Oh, yeah, but then it's going to inevitably turn back into the mirror, because at 30, is going to go, yeah, I didn't do that. Oh, no, it's the mirror again, showing that I'm a sinner. I'm in trouble. Oh, I'm okay. Jesus died for that. I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. Now the gospel can work. Yeah, Jesus died for that, too. But if that mirror isn't showing you a sinner back, then the gospel doesn't do you any good. So that's why we have those three uses of the law. The mirror kind of is always there, always turns back into the mirror, as long as we are still here. It will always, always turn into the mirror because the law always accuses. And that's what we'll stop for tonight.